If I, perchance, fell upon a million dollars, how many of you would take me up on the offer for me to pay for your vacation? All expenses paid. Are you in need of a vacation? Anybody in need of a vacation? I know our vacation Bible school team is in need of a vacation. And, but, but here's the thing. I just happen to fall upon millions of dollars, and I want to pay for your vacation. Where would you go? What would you do? Who would go on a cruise? I would go on a cruise because all the food is on the boat. You never have to f stress about where are we going to eat tonight. I mean, they even have a midnight chocolate buffet. Now, whoever would stay up till midnight, I did. I did. I, I went on one cruise, and I had to experience it. Uh, and let me tell you, I woke up the next morning not feeling very well, but I experienced it. And uh, so we have some cruise folk. Okay, what about, uh, I heard first sermon when I did this, some said Australia. Anybody? I know Jackie would go, and, and Zini would go. Oh, we got some other Australia folk. All right, I would probably go to Canada. Now, if I'm paying for my own vacation, that would work out well. I would go to Canada. I would see my beautiful family, who I haven't seen in over a year. And uh, so I, I, would, I would soak up every moment. Now, now, on your vacation, here's what I would need you to do. There are strings attached to my paying for your vacation. Since I couldn't go with you, I would want you to write down every moment that you had. Journal. Would you be willing to journal for me? The fun times, the exciting times. What about, would you take pictures for me? You would? That's so nice. And, and um, I would want you to just remember every detail of your trip. Here's why. Because I would want to experience it with you. Is that possible? Yeah. Not really. I would read about it, but I wouldn't get the smells of the ocean if you were by the ocean. I wouldn't taste the food that you're writing about, and so I'd probably start becoming bitter. Like, man, that sounds really good, but I wouldn't be experiencing it with you. Children, all week, they changed the title of Vacation Bible School to Vacation Bible Experience because we want you to experience Jesus for yourselves, for yourselves. Your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, their experience will not cut it. It has to be something personal for you with Jesus that loves you. He accepts you. That, that's what makes us able to accept others. He forgives us. That's what makes us able to forgive others. Do you guys get that? All week I had the privilege of being Dr. Luke. I confess. The kids all week, you're Dr. Luke. And I would come out and without my uniform, my costume, and I had Matt. But they knew it. They saw right through the little glasses disguise and the, the stethoscope and the doctor's jacket. So you got it. I was Pastor Matt the whole time. But I so loved hanging out with you kids all week. And so I wanted to end this, this morning, this VBS, with this idea of experience. Each of us experience Jesus individually, amen? And unfortunately, there are many times where we run into others that are also in the process of experiencing Jesus. And I want to show some pictures for the kids up here, because in this uh, Walt Disney, I think it's Walt Disney, who does Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> I think that when you look at these Winnie the Pooh characters, they represent some Christians, all right, so let's look at our first Winnie the Pooh character on the screen this morning, kids. Okay? Who do we got here? Eeyore. So have you ever met an Eeyore? This is somebody, and let me just read my notes. This is a Christian who would sound something like this. Woe is me. It's not much of a life. He might have healed then, but it probably won't happen now. I have a home here. It's not much of a home. Here we have an example of what happens when we settle for an orange crate instead of desiring the mansion 
that God has promised us in heaven. Amen? And so this life is not all there is. But unfortunately, life is tough, and so we do meet the Christians that represent your. They become very discouraged, very, and they, they become to look inward instead of outward, and they rely on their own strengths instead of relying on God's strengths. Have you ever met an Eeyore? Have you ever been an Eeyore? Yes, I have. All right, let's check out the next one. This is Winnie the Pooh himself. All right. So let's see what about this. Well, if I could just get my hands on the honey pot, everything would be better. You ever watch Winnie the Pooh? He's always trying to get the honey and the honey pot. Pooh is always looking for the temporary fix in finding the sweet things of life. He, got his, he has his eyes on the pot of gold, so to speak, as if it would make everything all right. If things got tough, he just focuses on the material stuff. If he just had one more thing, his life would be okay. Does that sound like anybody you know? Sometimes that comes out as envy. Envy. We're not happy with what we got. Now, I, as I was doing this, I was actually thinking of some church members that represent not poo, but wait till we get the Tigger. We have some Tigger folk in our church. And I almost put a bunch of pictures up there. So let's go to our next one before I get distracted on that. We have Piglet. Little Piglet. And you know, I heard some kids this week that kind of represented Piglet. Okay? And this is what Piglet might say. Oh, I just don't know. I'm afraid that God might be too busy to worry with me, little Piglet. God couldn't possibly use me to do anything for his kingdom. Does that sound familiar, little kids? Some of you were wondering. I'm too little. Get rid of it. God can use anyone at any time. No matter how little, no matter how old, no matter how young. All right? So don't be a little piglet. All right? All right. Let's go to gopher. We need, we need these folk in the church. These are your work bees. These are work, work, work. It's all about the work. And they get so caught up in doing ministry that they, uh, like the gopher, sometimes ends up going the wrong way as he's digging and working so hard. And so he's so busy. And I have to admit, I've been a gopher many times. Now here's my favorite. Tigger. Tigger, I w you know, I wish we had a lot more Tiggers in our church, but let's talk about Tigger for a second. Ah, oh, what it would be like if we had more Christians as Tiggers. Tigger is eager, bouncing, and ready to go. You name it. Oh, you need a helper? I'm there. Before he even knows what he's volunteering or she's volunteering for, Tigger is ready to go. He is ready to go, or she is ready to go. He has a willing heart, or she has a willing heart. Maybe even Tigger doesn't even think that they can do it all the time, but their eagerness is just so radiant, and they're so excited to get involved. I love Tigger, and I love our members that, you know, this church is so awesome. We've just finished a whole week of VBS filled with Tiggers and little Tiggers and little piglets and you name it. And, and now next week we're doing another whole thing called Family Promise. This church loves to do ministry, Amen. And I am so grateful for you, uh, represented as Tigger. Um, so anyway, and let's go to the last one. Rabbit. Rabbit and Tigger don't get along. Why? Because Tigger likes to get involved in other business, and before he even thinks, Tigger is already helping and stepping all over Rabbit's hard work garden and, uh, you know, up suits, up, upsets the fruit basket or the carrot basket in this, uh, in this uh, picture. And so Tigger and Rabbit sometimes don't get along. But Rabbit is also a hard worker, dedicated. Um, and so there's not a wrong or a right one, but each one has their own strengths. Would you agree? We need all of you to be involved in your churches and your communities. And uh, so just really quick, I wanted to show you these. Um, open your Bibles, if, if you would. I want to read this to you. All week, we've been looking at Luke. Um, again, I was Dr. Luke. Another section of Dr. Luke was Dietmar. Dietmar, can you stand up so the kids can see your true identity? This is Dietmar. He was the other Dr. Luke. We had two sections of uh, the Bible Adventure Station. 
So Dietmar, thank you for your hard work. And I had one other helper that I'm going to call up for children's story. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll introduce her in a second. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Luke 6. Luke 6. Now the neat thing about Luke is all week we've been looking at Luke. Luke differs than in the book of Matthew. Now there's a lot of similarities. But what I love about the book of Luke, Dr. Luke, he was actually not an eyewitness to any of the things Jesus did. But because he was a doctor, so thorough, he went and found eyewitnesses. And he got the descriptions. He got everything that went on. And actually, in the book of Luke, if you have a Bible that has red lettering, Luke is the one gospel that has more than any other gospels, Jesus' words. Okay? So if you're flipping through Luke, that gospel has the most red letter words, which represents what Jesus said, than any other gospel. All right, so he was so thorough in getting eyewitnesses to say, well, what did Jesus tell you as he healed you? And what I love about Luke is it was all about the experience. Luke found those that experienced Jesus, and their lives were never the same after that. Isn't that amazing? When we experience Jesus, our lives will never be the same after that. Now, it can It can, if you just have a one-time encounter with Jesus. But what we want to encourage you children and encourage myself is we should have a daily experience with Jesus. Amen? Daily. So in, in Luke 6, let's look at 43. Luke 6, chapter 43. Chapter 6, verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Folks, this is talking about an experience with Jesus If we are having regular experiences with Jesus, the overflow of that will flow out in our actions, in our words. And people will know by, the Bible also talks about the fruits of the Spirit. People will know that you are different, that you have hope, that you have received something that this world cannot offer you by the way you you walk and talk. Isn't that amazing? And so when then there's people in the community or out there that are discouraged. They're the Eeyore in your community. And you get to go in and be a tigger and upset everything and say, you know, I have a hope. I have found a hope. I have found the God that will change your life once you experience him. Luke, again, was talking to a specific generation, a group of actually unbelievers, Gentiles, compared to the Jewish believers of that day. So when you look at Matthew... Matthew was speaking to Jewish believers. And what I loved about Luke is he tried to be very specific on the people that he found, those that had an encounter and experience with Jesus and were never the same after that. When you look at the differences between the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and how Matthew, when he's talking, he puts a a spiritual twist on it. But in Luke, on the Sermon on the Plain, which is similar... And it's found in Matthew, you know, Matthew 5 is the Sermon on the Mount for, the, uh, for that. But the, the Sermon on the Plain, which is in Luke, which is in chapter 6, there are some similarities. But here's what I want you to understand, kids and church family. When Luke is talking, he oftentimes was talking to the folk that felt like they couldn't cut it. They were not good enough. They were put down. They were the children. Our very first story that we shared with the children is the disciples got so protective of Jesus' time. Remember, kids? And they said, no, no, you cannot bother Jesus. He is too important, too busy. But what did Jesus say? He said, suffer the little children to come. And he called the children to him. And they sat on his lap and he healed them. Who do you think brought the children to Jesus? Their parents the workers of that day, the families. Children need you. Our children need you to bring them to the foot of Jesus. 
so that they can have those daily experiences with Jesus. So thank you, families. Thank you, workers. Thank you for bringing the kids to VBS this week. They need you. And so as Luke writes to these folk that feel like they're not good enough or they've, they've messed up or all of this, he goes to the Sermon on the Plain, and he's again talking to those. And he says, blessed, which really in this one is more like lucky are you. So let's think about that. Lucky are you who are poor. And you think, what? Lucky are you who are poor? That doesn't make sense. Lucky are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Lucky are you who are weep now, for you will laugh. Lucky are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Lucky in that day, and you will, re- you will leap for joy. So what Luke was doing there, he was, he was saying, there is nothing that you can do on your own. And once you recognize that, the quicker you will come to the very source of life and joy and healing. Whereas in Matthew, Matthew's speaking to a religious group, and he puts the spin on it, blessed are you, happy are you, for when you are spiritually bankrupt, you are rich. But in Luke, he's talking again to those that don't know this. And so he's saying, once you realize that you cannot do it, it's okay. It's okay to recognize that you are poor now, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's okay to be hungry now. There will be people that will help you, but you will be satisfied when I come into the picture. Blessed are you who weep now. Lucky are you who weep now, for you will laugh once I come into the picture. See, he is speaking to a group that feel, again, lowest of lows, like they just aren't good enough, and that is the point. He is speaking to them, saying, that is the point. You cannot do this on your own, but you will be blessed when I enter into your life. Experience is so important. Uh, In John 17, 3, it says, "This this is what salvation is, to know you. All right, John 17, 3, let's look at it. It is all about the individual experience. And what's so amazing then about a church community and family is that we bring that individual experience once a week to church. And we share about what Jesus is doing in our life. Amen? That ought to be the idea. That ought to be the idea. John 17, 3 says this. This is Jesus' prayer. And he says this, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is salvation, to know. To know Jesus and God. To be in an experiential relationship with him. To be journeying with him. To recognize that we cannot do this on our own. And to surrender it to him. And to surrender it to him. You know, all week... Uh, This week, I've been so blessed. All last week, we were in camp meeting. And so I have not come off of the mountain. Do you know what I mean by that? You know, when Moses went up and had an encounter with God, he was blessed, and then he would come off the mountain. Well, I think it's pretty cool that when we do camp meeting or summer camp, we go all the way up to Prescott, and we have this mountaintop experience. And then we have to somehow figure out how do we bring that, those blessings, all those things back down to the valley back down to real life, back down to the struggles, back down to reality. Well, to be honest, I have not come down off the mountain yet because we had camp meeting, was such a blessing, and then kids, I got to spend a whole week with the kids. And man, if that doesn't make you so joyful to see them get excited and to experience Jesus maybe for the first time, I was sitting right here and I heard you singing. I heard you singing and that made me so happy. Because it's something that's real. It's growing. It's building up. It's bubbling out. And at camp meeting, I learned a pretty valuable lesson. I realized that we do not share our testimonies enough. We do not come into contact with each other and say, I got to tell you what God did in my life this week. We are so like Eeyore sometimes, where we come here, 
Oh, woe is me. You know, my week was so hard. And, you know, and that's contagious. That, that kind of, oh, and then you're like, oh, man, I'm sorry. That's te- well, let me tell you what's been, and we try to not one up, but we try to say, well, let me tell you what happened to me. This was really bad, okay? <laughs> and, then, and that's the wrong way. <laughs> we need to be going up. Well, I'm sorry you had a rough week, but, you know, let me share with you what happened to me. And, and maybe that'll give you encouragement because maybe we had a similar poor experience, but I want to share with you what God is doing in my life. We need to do that more. We need to do that. And so at camp meeting, we, we saw this unfold. We had young adults get up, and young adults range from about 18 to 35. Now, some would sneak in, and maybe 40, 45, and they still come into the young adult area, and we just loved everybody and accepted everybody. But I got to tell you, this was my first year as leading the young adult department. And I'm going to be honest with you. I found out not, I found out way too late that I was leading this department. And I already felt under the pressure. My best friend, Ben, moved away. He was the one in charge of that department. And now I had to somehow fill size 12 or 13 shoes, like literally, and, and try to create an atmosphere that he had been building for years and years. And so I already started going to camp meeting that, that week feeling like, so stressed, feeling like I wasn't good enough, feeling like this was not going to work out. And let me tell you, when a young adult got up and started sharing her testimony, I forgot about my little problems, forgot about the stress. And, And as she shared, she shared about how she felt like she wasn't good enough growing up. And I'm like, I can relate to that. And then at the end of that, the speaker made a call, and I saw these young adults come forward, and I realized then and there, it's not about me. It's not about if I got all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed. It's about this experience that they are wanting individually on their own with the God that loves them. And they came forward, and I tell you, I was so blown away by that. This happened night after night after night. These young people were willing enough to get up say, this is where I'm struggling right now. I need help. And they would share how God had been victorious in their lives and how they were searching for a community that would hold them accountable and and journey with them. There was this one young adult that shared not only once, not only twice, but three times. The first time he shared, he shared about how his mother at at 37 had died. Instantly, he was five, and she died of an aneurysm. And he shared about how that meant as a five-year-old boy, how he felt like his whole world had fallen apart. No mom. Dad was kind of busy all the time. And so he really shared about that struggle as a little child. And then he talked about how then dad remarried and and how this mom that kind of was trying to step into the place of his mom was abusive. Verbally, she she had a daughter that she brought into the marriage, and she would hold this daughter up as her precious daughter, child, and she would put him to the side. Like one time he shared about how he got in so much trouble, she locked him out of the house in his underwear for hours, no food, just out in in the, in the, and he lived in the city. So here you have this, this little boy locked out of his home in his underwear, no food and what that meant to him and what that did to him. And so you can only imagine what kind of life he turned to. He started to look, look at what the city offered a young growing up teenager. And so he got involved in a gang. This gang was the Latin Kings. And he had a specific talent where he would go and he would write and graffiti the territory of the Latin Kings so that other, other gangs that were coming to the area, they would know, oh, this is, this is, this is their turf. This is marked Latin Kings. This is, we're not going to go in there. If we go in there, there's going to be problems. We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to do our thing. And so this was what he was going up growing up in. And I'm not sure what age, but this was, I think, the second night he got up. He talked about how he got out. He wanted out of that life. He realized that that was not where he needed to live and be part of. And so as he was getting out, this same gang killed his father. Now, I don't know if it was because he was trying to get out, but they literally killed his father. And now he had no parents. He had this one mother that was pseudo-mom, 
that was, you know, again, abusive. And so he felt utterly alone. And so he shared how then God finally realized, as he turned all of this, he surrendered all to God, and he finally came to the point where he realized he had to ask his mom, for, that stepmom, he had to say, I forgive you. He had, now, he had now fallen in love with Jesus. He had now found out that because Jesus forgives me, I have to forgive you. And he talked to these young adults about the struggle of that. How do I do that when she probably will not change her ways? She will still verbally attack me. She will still do all these things. But he got to this point where he said, I can't go on. How will God bless me and forgive me if I'm not willing to forgive others? And so he came to her, and she had just went off on this tangent. And, and he looked at her, and he said, I need you to know something. I forgive you. And he said her countenance changed. The look on her face changed. And she started to weep. She started to weep. And after that, things became different in the home. Now, he shared part three at the end of camp meeting. He had just gone to the Sunrise Project. Many of you helped out with that. So Sarah, my wife Sarah, said, you know what? Are, are you kind of worried about your health as far as, you know, aren't those kind of you know, mom died of an aneurysm, maybe you ought to get checked out. And so this young guy said, you know what, I'm going to go, you know, we have a doctor here, Troy, and that's what he specializes in. So he went during the clinic time, and they took a test, and he texted us, and he said, I just found out I have an aneurysm. He said, I'm 36 now. My mom died at 37 of her aneurysm. He said, I'm worried. I'm afraid. And so they tried to tell him, well, you know, it's small still. It's only two millimeters, and we don't operate until five millimeters. And they tried to talk to him. But that night as he came forward, we said, would you be willing to share that fear, your worry, with these young adults? I mean, you have allowed these young adults into your story so far. This is like part three. And what are you going to do with this? And I want to tell you what he wrote. He came forward that night. This was Friday night. He came forward, and he said this, Clarity never comes. And we keep searching for something, blaming others along the way to get some sort of peace, some sort of answer, because we can't answer life's tough questions. But it never comes. Clarity never comes. What we need is certainty. Now keep in mind, he had just found this out. And this is what he tells these young adults up front. I am certain pain, the pain on God's children breaks God's heart. I am certain that God is still with us. I am certain that God in his love grants us the power to choose our own actions. I am certain that God is fair. I am certain that we are unconditionally loved by him. I am certain that God knows what it is like to lose someone. I am certain that those who feel like victims are precious to God. I am certain that God is with the brokenhearted. I am certain that God meant it when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary. And tired. I am certain that we need to come to Jesus and only Jesus for peace. I am certain that a day is coming when pain and cancer and tumors and mental illness and suffering will cease to exist. I am certain that soon we will see our loved ones. And lastly, he says, I am certain that those who trust in the Lord will renew and find strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's why I was blessed at camp meeting. Because I heard young adults sharing from their heart. These young adults, once they heard that, there was not a dry eye in the tent. They came forward and they put their arms on him, and there was a season of prayer. Some were praying for healing, some were praying for this newfound acceptance that he had just heard that he had this. 
There was prayer happening. And I am convinced when we begin to share honestly and openly about what God is doing in our lives, prayer will grow. Things will happen because we cannot help but be the same when we have an encounter with Jesus. A constant encounter with Jesus.